Hello, everybody. Welcome back for another episode here at the Trident Podcast with myself, Scotty B. Uh, actually, I guess we probably shouldn't call it a Trident Podcast anymore. We'll have to call it a Trident episode as we are uh, moving to uh, 100% video format now. Uh, so now you cannot listen to me any longer without having to see me, uh, which I realize is a tremendous loss for the community. Uh, but c'est la vie. That's how she's going to roll from here on out. Uh, this week, I am coming at you to uh, talk a little bit about Teams, Teams 40K. Uh, I want to recap our recent uh, Trident Team event, as well as uh, maybe talk a little bit about uh, how you can get involved in the Teams format for 40K, or AOS, or pretty much anything else for that matter. Um, as it is something that whilst it's definitely been around for a while, uh, is something that has kind of exploded in popularity, uh, I feel like, the last couple of years, especially locally, here in kind of Western Canada and such. Uh, Teams is a format that has existed, obviously, in 40k for many years, uh, especially across the pond, as they say. Um, and it is something that's kind of existed at like a fairly high level of play. Um, but in kind of the last few years, I want to say kind of ninth and 10th edition, uh, the idea of Teams events has become uh, much, much bigger, uh, a lot more people wanting to get involved, uh, not just from an organizing standpoint, but also, of course, from a player standpoint. Um, basically, nowadays, you, you, I, I don't remember running into somebody recently who, who hasn't told me that Teams is one of the coolest formats, one of the most fun formats uh, that anybody can play in. Uh, and guys are actively looking for teams events to go to, which is awesome uh, because it means that there is that draw and, and that there is both incentive and uh, reason for, for uh, organizers to get more team events out there. And that is something that we at Trident definitely will be doing down the line. Uh, but to, before we get you know into future events, let's talk about this one we just had. We, we did just uh, have our very first Trident team event uh, just uh, about two weeks ago now. Uh, just a little eight-team event. Uh, was GT style, so five games over the two days. Um, I was blown away <laughs> by the incredible support that we got, uh, especially from non-local uh, players. Uh, I didn't even think, I don't think I even really realized it until I was looking around on uh, Saturday. Uh, and I realized, wow, like, a lot of these guys aren't from around here. Um, I recognized a lot of them from bumping into them, you know, at various events here and there uh, over the last few years. But, you know, once I really sat down and kind of took stock of it, I was like, wow, we, we have eight teams at this event and five of them are not from Edmonton. Uh, there was like, you know, one or two uh, Edmonton players that were scattered in amongst them. Um, but ultimately we had, you know, three Edmonton teams and, and five that were not. Um, which is awesome. Uh, it's really cool to see that kind of support come from from kind of uh, more distant players, um, and that really is also exciting because you know it, it encourages us to encourages us to do more of this and to do uh, bigger and better events down the line. Uh, definitely, one of the things that we would be looking to do is is to expand the the format a bit, get a little bit more room, more room for some more more teams to participate because we know that there's so many people who do want to participate. Um, and that's kind of the thing is that like, when it comes to events, bigger is not always better. Um, there are, you know, times and places where a bigger event is, is the right thing. And there's times where not, you know, extending an event too large is, is actually better. But one of the things about teams is that it is almost always just better. Uh, the bigger you can go because for one, obviously it still gets more people involved, which is great, but like teams has like a social aspect to it, um, which I think is part of the draw, uh, really, because like it, it can still be a very competitive format. It's got some strategic kind of layers to it that, that a lot of, uh, regular 40 K doesn't have. Um, but it also is like inherently a more social style. Uh, and that is a huge draw because, of course, you're going with a couple of your friends and you also naturally then are probably going to get more uh, friendly with some of the other people who are there. Some people maybe you don't get to see very often because they're out of towners or or you kind of get like that camaraderie and, and that a little bit of uh, competitiveness going with some of the other people who are local or, or whatever. And it definitely I think it harkens back a little bit to the kind of beer and pretzel style uh, that, you know, we talk about ancient GW having, but 
you know, in, in the modern day is not always, uh, <laughs> it's not always well represented in the hobby. Uh, anyhow, so we do have, we do have these teams events, uh, now popping up kind of all over the place. Um, they're definitely growing, uh, especially here in Western Canada, I know, which is great. Uh, and we wanted to dip our toes in and this was our first crack at it. Uh, and it, things went off excellently. Um, one thing that I definitely, I don't think I, I don't think I fully kind of appreciated or was, was aware of or thinking about before the event, but which became very relevant once we got there. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Um, was that, you know, by, by having so many people come from different places, different metas, different local, uh, communities, uh, you do sometimes, uh, run into the possibility of, of having people who have uh, misunderstandings about how things are done, um, which is very uh, hilarious because like it feels like nowadays more than ever, GW is like pretty, pretty strict and pretty uh, voluminous with their rules. But of course there are so many things um, when you really get down to it that are like, you know, this is the way things are locally done. This is like common house rules or not even necessarily house rules, but just common understandings about uh, how, how different kind of things in the game that maybe GW has left up to interpretation are handled. Um, and I ran into that like a fair bit this weekend, considerably more than I expected. And it, it was pretty much always down to just like guys A who are used to think something being handled a certain way and guys B who are used to being handled a different way. And they're looking for clarification on like who's right and the funny part was a couple times it was kind of like well like neither of you are right which i don't even want to say like right because maybe it's just this is the way we do things um but in a few cases it was also like well like the understanding of how gw's rules work is a little different here and there um the beautiful thing about it was that even though that did crop up a fair number of times, like everybody was super understanding about it. Um, we managed to avoid like pretty much all the feel bads. I, I hope, um, certainly when I was speaking with guys, they all seemed to be very understanding when I explained how we would be handling whatever the situation was. Um, but it's something that's kind of neat almost, uh, even as I'm sure they don't necessarily appreciate it when it pops up in game, but from like my perspective as a TO, it's really neat to kind of see the almost culture clash of, uh, people coming from different communities with different understandings about things and seeing how that plays out. Um, but like I said, we'll touch a we'll touch on that a little bit later when we're discussing team strategy a little bit or, or getting into teams a little bit. Um, Sticking with this event, uh, we did we did have a GW uh, terrain layouts, which is something that I, I specifically chose. Uh, teams, of course, is very heavily influenced by the WTC um, format, uh, as they are the people who are kind of the gold standard of how things get run. Um, and WCT, WTC, of course, does have their own terrain setups, which I actually think are very good, um, but they are very different. Um, and I wanted to... I encourage i don't i don't want to say like a a more friendly format but certainly a format that's more friendly to gigantic models um because <laughs> that is one thing that wtc format is extremely harsh on uh and the gw terrain formats are nice because more players and i, I didn't really know how many teams veterans we were going to be getting um more players who play in singles or just pick up games or whatever are obviously more familiar with the gw formats in general uh unless they happen to know somebody or play in a lot of wtc events um those those WTC layouts, I, I was worried they might be a little bit more obtuse to some folks. So we went with the GW layouts. Uh, I was playing GW missions, of course. Uh, I was not playing Leviathan missions, like from the Leviathan mission pack. Uh, I was using all the GW rules and stuff, but I was throwing in a few mixers, uh, partially because I, I did, again, want to kind of shake that up a little bit. I know we've all talked ad infinitum about how much chilling rain sucks. And of course, GW has listened as the Priya Nexus pack, which is coming out uh, not too long from now, seems like it's going to be pretty good. Um, but for this event, you know, I, I did kind of do some some custom combos of missions. Um, the, go the goal was to kind of shake things up a bit, have some missions that were a little bit different. Um, I did get some commentary on, I think it was round two or three 
I think it was on the first day for sure. I can't quite remember, but I had a couple people approach me about one of the missions in particular and saying they really liked it. They had wished that it was one of the ones that was actually uh, in the competitive Leviathan pack, which is always a nice compliment. So thank you to those folks. Uh, <laughs> but we were trying to have some slightly different missions uh, to kind of shake things up a little bit in the team's format. <laughs> And then, yeah, we played five games over the two days. Uh, we had a really nice mix of teams. I felt like most of the teams were actually like not tremendously different in skill level, which is always nice. Uh, it's not something you can control, obviously, but like honestly, there were there were very few matchups where you know I looked at a table and saw Team A and Team B and thought that one of them had a distinct advantage over the other. Um, there was quite a few teams that actually had a, a decent amount of skill on them, and then it just kind of goes down to you know, do you get the matchups you want? Is this mission that you're playing this round better or worse for your team? And then of course you know how it all plays out, um, and that did a like WTC format naturally obviously encourages um, more draws just because. It, it does have a format i'm not gonna get too deep into it here but it does have a format that you know um has both players and teams uh count a count their round as a draw if their scores are even fairly close together not if they're directly tied um so you know you do get a fair number of draws in wtc format but we actually had a lot of draws i feel like uh for this event um <laughs> which again i don't know if the players love it but it does you know suggest that there was a lot of times where two teams were very close together um so that's pretty cool uh and then yeah uh, at the end of the week we did we kind of had uh big winners on on both ends of the spectrum because of course we had our, our winning team uh know your role so that would be uh, uh, Adam and David and Aiden and Chris, uh, who ended up uh, getting a 5-0 and record and, and taking the best general. Uh, but at the other end of the uh, uh, equation, we did have Birchwood Wargaming, who uh, unfortunately finished last in the standings. I hope they had a good time nonetheless. It seems like they did. However, they did, of course, win uh, our, uh, our free tickets to GamesCon, which by the time you guys are watching this, uh, will be going on just this coming weekend. Um, where we will have a Trident booth up right near the big Warhammer narrative event that's going on all weekend. Um, and you guys can come check it out, and hopefully Birchwood Wargaming enjoys their tickets to the event as well, and maybe you'll see them there. Uh, so, And then, of course, we had a, a bunch of other uh, raffle prizes and whatnot. Uh, Tom Carter took home best presentation for his, uh, his beautiful orc army. Uh, if you've never gotten to see our Tom's orcs, well you're missing out. Uh, I highly encourage you to go find him, even if it's at his house, sneak into there at night while he's asleep and go check out his orcs because uh, they're gorgeous. Uh, but I'm sure you've you've had a chance or, or you will sometime soon because he's all over the place. So, uh, But overall, the event was very good. We do really want to scale that up in the future. Uh, like I said, this is our first event, so it's kind of just us trying some stuff out. Uh, there's some things that we're uh, doing at Trident in general that we'd like to start rolling out to more events, uh, things that we're kind of considering. A lot of the stuff that we're changing or, or kind of soft launching is stuff that we're going to be looking to do over the summer or at our own big event, EWO, in the fall. Um, but some things definitely for teams to try to, to work on would be scaling the event up a little bit as far as our, our player and team counts. Uh, in the future, Trident wants to lean more into um, spreading the love a little bit uh, when it comes to uh, awards and stuff like that. We're definitely thinking, especially for bigger events, we're going to be leaning towards awarding, uh, you know, at least something, uh, some, some uh, uh, trophies and or prizes for first, second, and third place uh, teams and players. Um, we're probably looking at doing that for both presentation and for generalship um, and there's a few other kind of neat ideas that we're bandying around with each other uh, and we'll see how it goes but anyhow that's stuff that we're looking looking at for the future uh, and in your guys's future uh, one of the other thing I kind of want to talk about today was maybe uh, if you were interested in teams events and you hadn't had the chance to go to one yet or maybe you had but you're still fairly new to it um, wanted to kind of share some of my experiences that I have in, in the numerous team events I've gone to and some things to think about to help you have a uh, more enjoyable experience, number one, um, and to get the most out of the experience, but also some things you can do to help yourself have more success at them as well, if you're interested uh, in that sort of thing. Uh, so that'll be something that we're going to dive into right now. All right, so caveat obviously like i i said earlier uh teams is naturally a very social format it is probably the best way for you to enjoy a weekend of 40k with your buddies 
Um, and for a lot of folks, that is literally the end of it. Um, it's just a, a wicked cool way to kind of get together a couple friends with the hobby you love and go and immerse yourself in it for, for a weekend. Um, and if that's, you know, really all you want to throw at it, that's perfectly fine. That's obviously fine anytime. Uh, and Teams kind of just enables that even better. But <clears throat> for a lot of folks, especially if you are traveling and you're kind of taking yourself into unfamiliar territory where you're going to run into some, some new folks or, or some new metas and stuff like that, uh, you can actually do yourself a lot of favors by doing some work ahead of time to help make your uh, whole experience better. Um, probably the number one thing that I would say, and you, you should probably do this on both a personal and a, uh, and a, a team level is to set yourself some expectations. Um, sometimes guys are specifically going to an event with thoughts in their head to, to achieve a certain something, whether they want to compete for, uh, a best presentation or a best general award or, or best sports or something like that. Or if they just are considering themselves, they, they want to, you know, be considered for those things, be, be a team that finishes highly in one of those categories, or if they're literally just going to, you know, hopefully bounce into a few, uh, friends that they don't get to see very often, things like that. Um, it's also important that the players on the team probably set some personal expectations for how they're going to do, which is obviously going to have a lot to do with uh, what the team composition is, how practiced the player is, what the meta is like, all that stuff. But the thing about it, and the reason I mention these things, is because, like I said, this is a highly social uh, event where you're going to be with your buddies for like, you know, 14 plus hours a day the whole weekend. And a huge part of getting the most uh, enjoyment out of it is to is having everybody's mood stay high, uh, and that you know doesn't always happen. Uh, one of the biggest pitfalls uh, emotionally with teams I have found is with guys who, um, because you know the team format, like you have your individual scores, but then your your combined scores are used to determine whether your team wins or loses a round. So a guy has a bad game or two. And then he feels really bad because he feels like he's dragging down his team. Uh, and that is like awful because first off, his buddies probably don't want him to feel that way. And they probably tell him as much. Um, but a lot of folks just can't shake it, right? <laughs> and so that's the thing where a lot of times setting expectations ahead of time can go a long way towards making sure that you're not in a negative mind space at any point during or after the event. Um, to do that, obviously, like... One thing you can do is some homework. Uh, in some cases, maybe you are going to know a lot of the people there. So you can have a good idea of, you know, how your team stacks up. Sometimes you can't uh, because you just aren't going to know that many people. But, you know, BCP can be your friend uh, because you can probably go back and look at some of the other things that are going on there. ITC can be your friend because you can uh, go and see who some of these players are, how they've been doing. Uh, maybe you can kind of check out what they've been playing lately, have an idea. Again, rough ideas, obviously, but rough ideas of what people are going to be see, uh, bringing to the event. Uh, educate yourself just a little bit on teams and what the format kind of tends to bring. Uh, and with all that in mind, you can get at least some idea of how your team's going to do. Um, now, of course, <laughs> the goal is always to, to just do as best as you can, and that's fair. I only mention it just because, like, you know, the, the nature of competition... Uh, style 40k or AOS or whatever is that you know you, you sometimes have good days and bad days uh, both on the table and off uh, and some players you know are more invo emotionally invested than others but you really don't want to ever be uh, having a bad weekend when you're supposed to be having a great weekend with your buddies um, so more than anything helping to set or setting some expectations ahead of time can help you to remain in a good headspace all weekend or whatever, whether it's a one day, four day, whatever the length of the, the event is. Cause that like more than anything or more than usual is important. Um, at the end of the day, those, those guys are your teammates and I can understand that you don't want to, you know, let them down or you don't want one of them to feel bad or whatever, or be having a bad time. But at the, the the end of the day, the most important thing is that you, you did have a good time. And whilst we say that to ourselves a lot in solo play, when you're in team play, like, it gets magnified, right? Because, <laughs> you know, like I said, you're going to be with these guys all day and probably after, especially if you traveled. You know, you guys are staying in the same place. You're probably doing meals together. Um, 
you know, so try to keep everybody in a, in a good mindset. Uh, and there's lots of things you can do about that while you're in the moment. But one of the best things you can do is just go into it with a clear head about uh, what you what you want, what your goals are, uh, what what's realistic, what's not, uh, and how you're going to handle it if things don't go, you know, how you have originally envisioned. Um, with a mind to that, to help you find more success on the tabletop, because oftentimes, even if you don't consider yourselves uh, a team that's going to do particularly well in any way, if you then have a little bit more success than you expected to, you're on cloud nine, which is great. So some things you can do to really help yourself out with that uh, in regards to team play. Um, first off, obviously, a lot of the things that you might do in solo play are, uh, still apply, like, you know, doing a little research at a time, making sure you know the meta, what's common, what's, what's really good right now. Um, and like I said, maybe hopping on ITC or, or BCP and trying to research some of the some of the players that are going to be there. But other things uh, that kind of uh, touch on some stuff I talked about earlier include like literally becoming like the best rules guy in the world, which I know sucks. <laughs> and some people don't uh, necessarily want to uh, be big rules guys, but the reason why I tell you it's actually almost more important to know your rules for teams events than it is for solo events is because of the travel aspect of it. What I what I referenced earlier with uh, what is the actual expected way that guys were or that the TOs will handle all of those little areas in the rules where GW you know has not really provided us a clear answer on what they want. Um, things like, you know, uh, for one, what is the terrain style? Oftentimes it's going to be WTC because uh, Teams is a WTC format. Uh, WTC is big all over, got his fingerprints all over that, and they do really good work. They have a really good um, FAQ. Uh, they have a, a couple of rules packs on the WTC website that you can read up on, and of course they have their terrain layouts, which you can go and take a look at. Um, they are very different from your standard GW stuff, and that will also, of course, inform your army choices and list choices, etc. But maybe some team events like ours is using GW. Um, instead because of you know whatever reason they're trying to to appeal to a different audience perhaps um or you maybe they're using uktc terrain who knows point is you can look it all up ahead of time and, and generally you will know this stuff uh, but also things like how are they going to play you know first floor windows uh how are they going to play the whole uh can you stand exactly an inch away from from a wall to try to block charges on you know large model bases or do they have a workaround that they use that that local group uses for that um you know how they handle large doorways and buildings can large models still pass through them or not you know things like that there's lots of little things that sometimes are different in a different city or with a different to or a different gaming group to the way that you're used to playing it and it sucks when you know you, you play the game a certain way and then you find out halfway through a move phase that that's not how it's done because you're bumping up against somebody who comes from a different uh community who play it differently um ultimately somebody's going to be right and that person is going to be the to because it's their event <laughs> so you need to you need to know that stuff ahead of time to, to kind of help you avoid those kinds of situations again like i said for us at our event everybody handled it really well even the times where i had to tell a guy i'm sorry but the way that this is being played here is blank and it it wasn't the way that he was used to it um, but you can also avoid that by just you know trying to find out ahead of time um, a lot of times tos will cover that stuff you know in in like a pre-round chat um, but by that point uh, obviously a lot of things have already been decided you've already showed up with your team you have your armies and all those types of things uh, maybe it doesn't matter to you but maybe it does so those are things that are great to learn ahead of time uh, i also mentioned like i said the terrain the terrain i really cannot say enough about knowing what type of terrain is going to be used because like i said wtc terrain which is very common in teams events is very different um from gw it's all like so the the, the gist of it is uh, Every single piece just about is a big L, a big L-shaped building uh, on bases which are roughly the size of those L-shaped buildings. Um, and really all that changes is the orientation of those L-shaped buildings, which will open up or, or close off more lines of fire. Um, it, WTC very much rewards uh, fast moving armies or or armies that of course can you know move through buildings which helps a lot uh, large large models can have a really tough time especially if they aren't very fast um, because the they 
can't get to where they need to go uh, to do the shooting or the or the combat that they want to, uh, generally speaking, um, because WTC really like the terrain style is just really prohibitive for that. With that said, that the same can be said about GW. There's certain armies that don't play as well on GW terrain or do play better, um, and those knowing those types of things will go a long way towards helping you decide both a what you're going to take uh, and then what what you know within a given army list you're going to take. Um, there is, and I'm not going to have a video here about it. There is a huge amount of strategy that goes into. Um, what armies you want to bring for a team's event. Um, WTC uh, is functionally built for eight player teams, which is bigger than the teams that you will find at most um, events, most team events nowadays. Um, certainly that is the way that WTC still runs their their personal events, um, but a lot of like smaller events, like the reality is it's just hard to get eight guys together all on one team. So a lot of teams are, you know, they might, really small events might be doing like three person teams. Uh, four is quite common. Maybe sometimes you see five or six. Um, but even still, wh whatever it might be, what you actually bring on a team's team uh, roster is not necessarily always obvious because it, it will still, there are times where it's literally like, well, we're all going to play our highest win rate army and go for that. That literally can work sometimes. There are also some like sleeper armies, which are actually pretty good uh, because the nature of teams is that, of course, you you do have kind of a drafting phase where you, you set matchups uh, by playing off the draft rules against each other. Um, and sometimes that means that like certain armies can dodge some really bad matchups for them or, or can prey on armies that maybe are pretty common in the meta, um, but there's some bad counters to, you know, things like that. Again, that is worth like its own like three hour video. Um, it also kind of depends on what the actual draft is, which is something uh, that again, you can usually find out ahead of time. I know for our event, we used a, a custom draft that I came up with. Um, the WTC drafting format is very, very good. It is literally been put together by some smart people and, and edited and, and worked on and it, it works very well. My issue with it and the reason we didn't use it is because it is, again, built for eight player teams <laughs> and the smaller teams get, in my opinion, the less well it works, it becomes more and more random. Um, that doesn't mean that there isn't any strategy to it. There, of course, is. Um, but I just, this for smaller team events, I, I like it a little less. Um, but certain TOs will absolutely still use it. They may also have their own version of draft. Um, whatever it may be, cool thing about drafts is that it's actually something that you can practice ahead of time. Uh, especially once you get to the point where you've submitted lists and you know what everybody's bringing and stuff. You can literally draft ahead of time. Uh, get some sheets of paper out, play a, play a card game, you know, go for it. Um, these are easy things to do. Um, but to be fair, obviously, bef before lists are submitted all, you may not necessarily know. Um, but you can obviously have an idea by literally going on stat check and checking what armies have been good and going on uh, BCP or whatever and seeing who's coming and what they play and what they like to play, uh, which again, won't work for everybody, but there's going to be players where there's an obvious footprint for and you can do that kind of homework. Um, and especially as a team, the nice thing is you've probably got a couple players who can all work together to accomplish this stuff. Uh, and it can be very fun for some players to do this kind of research end of the, of the team play um, strategy. Uh, so those are some things you can do to kind of give yourself a leg up when you're deciding what to bring. Uh, it is very common in teams events. It was for ours and for WTC, I know, uh, that you can only bring each faction once on a team, which is to say that each faction keyword can only appear on a single player's army list. So you can't have two players both playing Eldar, for example, or something like that. Um, generally that, I want to say generally that applies to Marines uh, in the sense that like you have a single Marine army and like you can't have like a Space Wolf and a Blood Angel. Uh, but that also is ambiguous. Sometimes some places allow different Marines as long as they're from strictly different codexes, uh, sometimes not. Uh, keep in mind, and this actually did come up at our event, although it was handled uh, tremendously sportingly by the players involved, um, but that also does include allies. So like if somebody has a Calidus Assassin, that is an Imperial agent, and that means that nobody else in that particular uh, army or in that particular team can have 
a Calidus assassin. <laughs> you know, you can't have, or, or for that matter, any other Imperial agent, uh, Inquisitors or Breachers or whatever else. Um, you end up having that be something that maybe plays into how you design your army list. Uh, Nurglings, a uh, very common Chaos ally. If you got several different, you know, maybe you have a Chaos Knight and a Chaos Marine and a Chaos Daemon all on the same team. That's actually fine and legal, but they can't all be bringing Nurglings then. Uh, in fact, only the Chaos Daemons can be. They're the only Chaos Daemon that can be on that, on that team. Um, so yeah. Obviously, doing a little bit of work on that, making sure you know the rules. Uh, I, as always, I cannot recommend to enough people to read the rules commentary that GW has out. Uh, I know I, I hear it from my friends all the time. Uh, I'm not reading that 18-page monster. I genuinely believe that you actually would will be a better informed player <laughs> in 40k. Uh, by reading the rules commentary than reading the base rules. Because, like, the base rules for 40k, well, yes, there are some hitch-ups in there that are different from past editions. By now, if you are not new to the game, you know those rules. So just read the rules commentary because it's relevant to so much stuff. Um, it becomes important because, obviously, you know, team events are large events, and because of... Um, I think some very good reasons. Um, you're not necessarily supposed to have a whole lot of conversation with your teammates during games. Um, and that means that, yes, if you have a rules dispute, you're calling the TO. But there's going to be a lot of people at a team event. Uh, and so whether or not you're always able to get a ref or a TO is always iffy. Um, hopefully there's always enough bodies around, but just in case there's not, it can go a long, long way, especially when you're, like I said earlier, dealing with people who maybe come from different house rules than you do to understand what the actual rules say uh, and to do as much reading ahead of time to know what that particular event is using as far as rulings go. Again, luckily for your, everybody, pretty much anybody who's running a team event nowadays gives you tons of information that you can reference so that you can know uh, exactly what your your the rules being used for that event are. Um, right down to oftentimes telling you even the missions, um, which is a habit that we do at Trident and, and one that I have noticed has become more and more common uh, the last few years and I hope continues to become more and more common because uh, I think sharing the missions ahead of time is just an easy quality of life thing that, that TOs can do um, to help players out. Uh, but I digress. Um, the other thing that kind of uh, I think is, is uh, relevant uh, when talking about team composition um, is like the, the battle between like the theory and the practice. Um, I know we have run into this with a few times uh, with Trident when we were going to team events uh, where we have had to ask ourselves the question, okay, player X plays this best. That is the army they've been playing lately. That is the army, maybe in some cases, the only army they've really played at all. But X uh, could borrow this other army uh, from another player um, that is functionally fairly similar. Uh, and is doing much better. I know we had this exact talk literally last October when we went to Saskatoon about one of our players uh, who was playing Drukari, who were at the time and honestly for much of 10th edition have been in the dumps, um, but he was reasonably familiar, this player, with the Eldar army, who of course in October were off the wall busted. Uh, and we literally talked a little bit about it and said, well, like, it might make sense for him, like even though he's not practiced with Eldar, for him to swap to that because it'll, you know, give him a much better chance in the games he plays. Uh, and we ultimately didn't end up doing it, and the reason for it really came down to the re reality that, again, one, our goal was to have a good time, and whilst winning is fun, don't get us wrong, um, there was serious consideration that whether or not the player would have fun. Uh, they were, as much as Drukari were not good, they were having fun playing them. They enjoyed it. Um, and that wasn't necessarily going to be mirrored with Eldar. The other thing is anybody who's ever played an army you're not super practiced with, like, you end up forgetting things all over the place. And you usually end up kicking yourself after the game when you do remember them. And you end up, you know, having a litany of what-ifs in your brain, um, which sucks. So even though, like, from a 
you know, win rate perspective, it was a relevant conversation. Uh, we have maintained uh, through more team tournaments, we have maintained a, a policy of no, it's better for somebody to play what they're practiced at. Because for one, it leaves you less room to forget stuff. For two, oftentimes we, I think, put a little bit too much, um, too much weight on, you know, win rates or what, you know, Reddit is telling us is good and bad and not enough uh, respect towards like just who a player is, what they're good at doing, uh, what they're comfortable with doing, uh, and just being able to profit off that player's uh, familiarity and and exp expertise with what they do play. Um, so with that in mind, I would always suggest that to that to anybody who's considering you know putting a team together for a team event. Yes, you do want to put some thought towards you know coming up with a team composition that is you know has lots of good matchups and doesn't have like an obvious you know. Uh, team comp that they're going to run into and get rolled over and stuff like that. Um, but within that, you still have to also be like, yeah, but like, how much do we overextend ourselves playing armies that we don't even necessarily want to play just to try to dodge bad ma bad matchups? Uh, it's better to play what you love uh, and what you're what you're good at, even if that maybe doesn't make for as good of a team because like the results you get will still be better uh, unless you really are someone who can absolutely jump into an army and play two games with it and be a master. Uh, and if you are, well, all the power to you. <laughs> but again, going back to the fact that as much about having fun as it is about winning, uh, you will have more fun doing. Uh, a team event with with things that you're comfortable with than trying to you know come up with some meta monster um, the other thing is that uh, getting practice in uh, now that's relevant no matter what obviously uh, <laughs> you, you you are always probably trying to practice for team event or for tournaments um, but like it can pay to be like you know have that discussion with your teammates and be like okay so like realistically what are some matchups that are uh, relevant to me that I can get some practice in because the reality of teams is that you are probably going to see more of you know one or two types of matchups than you might otherwise expect at like say a, a normal tournament where your your matchups are semi-random um, because maybe you play an army where you, you know it's obvious that the opponent will constantly be trying to get their whatever player into you because your army is supposedly bad into this army uh, or maybe they're always trying to get such an army away from you because vice versa uh, i cannot tell you the value or cannot uh, extol the value enough of practicing versus your bad matchups um, because that is a secret to team play success that can go a long long way um, knowing that, you know, oh, such and such is a bad matchup and lots of teams will be trying to get, you know, their, their, uh, players who play this army into me because they think it's a good matchup for them. If I can practice that matchup and make that less of a bad matchup because I am knowledgeable about it and I know what to do in the bad situations that I can end up there, that can go a long way towards flipping the script on that team because they will prioritize getting that matchup, which maybe then means that your teammates can maybe get another good matchup for one of them. And then you play the game and whether the guy wins or loses versus you, uh, or, or maybe just gets a draw or whatever. The point is that you're reducing his score. He's not going to do as well as he thought he did because you're really practiced into it. And you've managed to find ways to, to mitigate what is perceived of as the negative side of it. Um, and that can, you know, mean that the, as I said, with WTC scoring, all your scores get combined from you and your other teammates. Suddenly, you know, your team starts coming out ahead, even if you lose. Uh, and indeed, this is quite a common thing in, in especially like six to seven, six, seven, eight player teams is that the reality is you're going to get bad matchups. Uh, there's no way your opponents are not going to get a single good matchup out of eight if they know anything at all about what they're doing. So that means that sometimes it is literally about just trying to mitigate uh, you've got, you know, some guys who are like, well, I'm going to fall on the sword here, but I'm going to do my best to keep it close. And in the meantime, some of our other players are going to get good matchups and they're going to try to do the opposite. They're going to try to get that big 20 to zero win. Um, again, this is a very common strategy at that level. It's honestly not an uncommon strategy, even at like a four or five person team level. It's not always as easy because there's a little bit uh, less wiggle room when you don't have, you know, eight uh, stages of a draft to go through. 
but it is something to be considerate about. Uh, it's also something to be considered about even when you're drafting up which armies you're taking. If you if you know you have an army that doesn't have a lot of really bad matchups, maybe it doesn't have a lot of really great ones either, but hey, it, there's no one that it's awful into. Uh, some armies also get a rep for like, they don't necessarily win or lose a ton, but they never lose really bad. Um, those are great armies to bring, uh, to have on a team, because it's like, in, in WTC scoring, it's not really just about wins and losses, it's about how big of a win, how big of a loss. So if I lose a lot of games, but I lose them by five points, that's fine. You know, that's actually, in a lot of ways, helpful to your team, if they know that, because that means that they can try to feed you into matchups that are potentially really worrisome for the, for the team, uh, and expect that you're going to be able to keep a relatively close game. Um, uh, whether it's a draw or a narrow win or loss or whatever. Um, so that's definitely something else to consider. Um, and finally, <laughs> and this is, again, one of kind of the real life things uh, that we might be talking about with, uh, with uh, solo tournaments is always, you know, oh, make sure you drink enough water, don't eat a bunch of greasy food, wear good shoes, sit down when you can. With team events, there's a whole other layer to that. Uh, you obviously, uh, in a lot of cases, will be traveling, but even if you're not, you do have to get together and, and kind of plan schedules with uh, several other guys. Um, if you are not traveling, it's almost more dangerous because, of course, there's the reality that maybe one or more of your team members ends up getting caught up in life stuff um, and they're late or they're missing or whatever. Um, so if you have people who are susceptible to that, maybe do some work at a time to try to figure out uh, how you're going to manage it. Uh, but more likely, if you are traveling and you are staying together, at least you're always going to know where everybody is. But you do want to do some work ahead of time because you absolutely do not want to be going uh, and, you know, sharing a space or whatever with a bunch of guys uh, and finding out when you get there that you have shitty beds or not enough of them or somebody's got some issues that, uh, require a lot more work than you guys uh, expected or whatever um, because of the travel nature of a lot of team play it is really really important that you do some work ahead of time to plan the trip itself uh, outside of Warhammer um, what's the vehicles we're using making sure that they're in good condition making sure that you guys are on the same wavelength when it comes to eating uh you want to find out a guy brings up uh, an allergy that comes up and he doesn't really mention it until it's too late and then somebody's cracking up a butter but or a, a jar of peanut butter inside the airbnb or something and you've got all sorts of issues i'm just saying like these seem like simple enough things but very intelligent, well-organized people sometimes make these mistakes. And it is really important to watch out for them because, again, a huge part of this is just having a good time. And you might not have a great time if, you know, you can't sleep uh, <laughs> both nights while you're there. Uh, or, you know, the car is too cramped. Or you had to eat alone repeatedly throughout the weekend, even though you technically came to hang out with your buddies and things like that. Um, so more than even just regular tournaments and even regular tournaments you might travel for, you really do want to put in the work to make sure you are being smart about uh, where you're lodging, how you're traveling, all that kind of stuff. Uh, especially if you are like with a big team, like if you're playing like an eight person team event or more, be considerate. Uh, think about like, you know, how you're going to share the shower and the bathroom and stuff like that. Um, because these are things that maybe sometimes people don't think about and then once you get there and in the moment you start to realize that this isn't as comfortable as you maybe were hoping it would be. Um, but anyhow, with all that said, uh, I'm going to wrap this up for this week. Um, like I said uh, earlier, GamesCon this weekend, we're there. We have a Trident booth. We will be right, uh, right by the big Warhammer 40k narrative event uh, being hosted by the Play On guys and Red Claw and ourselves. Uh, and be more than happy to host you guys down there at the booth come visit us we'll have a bunch of merch out for you guys to take a take a look at uh, and take in of course the rest of the con uh here it's going to be rocking pretty awesome so we hope to see you guys down there uh we'll be doing some more uh codex reviews coming up in the near future uh we kind of hit that weird spot for a couple months where gw wasn't releasing anything and then of course in the last like six weeks and in the next six weeks there's like 
a dozen books coming out it feels like <laughs> um so we've been waiting to get uh, some of the first ones like the orcs and the custodes and stuff and tau uh, let them kind of get out and play it a little bit he, as you guys have heard before i actually like to do the codex reviews a little bit after they've been out um so we'll be doing some of those coming up in the near future uh, and i hope you guys enjoyed uh talking about teams a little bit today uh, and we hope to catch you uh in our in our uh uh next uh next video <laughs> Uh, I keep forgetting because I, I want to say podcast, but like I said, we're, we are moving entirely to this, uh, this video format. Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's kind of a new frontier and, uh, we will actually be looking to, um, maybe make some improvements, I guess, some changes to our video format down the line. So stay tuned for those. Uh, as always, we do want to uh, thank our current, uh, patrons, uh, Frederick, Dustin, Chris, and Tyler. Uh, thank you again for everything you guys do to help make this possible. And, uh, I guess I'll see you guys all in the next one. Did you plug the Patreon? We need to plug the Patreon.